welcome to the Lubber's Hole, a Patrick O'Brien podcast. This week, like all the other weeks, you're with Ian. And with Mike. And Mike and I are rereading the Aubrey Maturin novels of Patrick O'Brien. And Mike, it's an important week this week. Tell us about the milestone coming up. Tell us how it relates to where we were last time. Oh, Ian, I'd be delighted to. Well, it, it is a milestone. We've just finished up the Commodore, I guess the week before last, right before our interview with Will and Captain Richard. But in the last chapter of the Commodore, we learned that the Bologna and the Stately had defeated two French 74s, captured a frigate and several transports off Ireland. Yeah. Stephen cared for the French wounded and found Diana living with a relative nearby. Wow. You know, big surprise here. Yeah. Jack and Stephen's nemesis, the Duke of Habakstall, had killed himself. Another big surprise. And then Diana took Stephen to her bed and asked him never to go to sea again. So a lot for one chapter, right? right? And now we're pulling down the 18th volume, The Yellow Admiral. And in this first chapter, Jack and the Bologna are redeployed. But Jack is back in London for a parliament session and to deal with complications from his slavery mission. Stephen's gone missing and Sir Joseph Blaine is worried. Oh, wow. It's it's funny. Sir Joseph Blaine often plays this part of being the chorus for us, doesn't he? And we open right there with Sir Joseph Blaine in his Admiralty office, speaking with a Mr. Needham from Army Intelligence about two missing Naval Intelligence officers. One of them is someone called Delaney, and the other one is someone called Maturin. Needham doesn't know Maturin, so he's giving this description, this update to uh, to Sir Joseph without really knowing the context. He is familiar, however, with Captain Aubrey, describes him as the gentleman who was so unfortunate at the Guildhall trial, son to the notorious General Aubrey. And Mike, this is a nice reminder that even though Jack is our hero, to the rest of the public, he's got this particular reputation and he's associated with these particular events. Many important people in London might have the same picture of Jack that Needham's got of him right here. And Sir Joseph educates Needham on the many naval victories that Jack has achieved uh, until the point where he's interrupted by an assistant delivering a set of completed pardons with an effective date well before Maturin's departure for Spain. So, Mike, already we get a picture that things have moved on here at the beginning of the Yellow Admiral. Yeah, we, we do. And, and you know, I, I think O'Brien's doing a fabulous piece of exposition here, you know, and and a lot of this conversation is serving that purpose. Blaine reaches down to the stack of pardons, holds up Stephen's pardon, and they discuss the Duke of Havokstall, uh, including the creatures, as Blaine says, that he employed. And Needham notes that, yeah, in fact, you know, Army Intelligence says that those creatures were the immediate cause of the Duke's self-murder. Mm. Blaine tells him all about the Duke's hatred for Matron, how Matron had put an end to two of the Duke's friends and their traitor's practices. Um, the reasons that Matron had to withdraw to Spain with his daughter and his protégés and, and his fortune before the Bolognas cruised to the Gulf of Guinea and the mission to stop the French from landing in Ireland. And so Needham is kind of like, oh, he did that. Oh, he did that. Oh, he did that. And, <laughs> you know, Blaine's explaining that after the Duke's death, it was easy to get these pardons for Stephen and Clarissa and Padine. And that he had informed Stephen and Diana, and they had left for Spain to gather his family and his wealth. But he's not been heard from or spotted since. And Sir Joseph hopes that Needham and Army Intelligence in Spain can help locate Matron. Right. We've had a few occasions in the past where the presence of the British Army on the Iberian Peninsula has kind of crossed over with the Aubrey Maturin timeline here. So clearly it's a fair hope. Um, so Joseph is really worried because of what had happened since then. Eight days after Stephen had returned to Spain, so Joseph had learned that our old friend Monsieur Dutour had arrived in Spain and had denounced Maturin once again as the prime mover in Peru's attempt to declare themselves independent of Spain. Needham was very impressed to learn that this Maturin, of whom he's heard little so far, was in fact the prime mover in what he seen as having been a very nearly successful mission. The Spanish had embargoed Stephen's fortune and planned to seize him when he 
came to claim it in Corona. And uh, Sir Joseph had been trying to get word to Stephen, had notified their agent in Corona, but the only reported potential sighting of Stephen Maturin that Joseph's got access to is in a military intelligence report of a wealthy couple traveling through Aragon. And Joseph has dismissed this because he thinks that Aragon's probably not on Maturin's route. Maturin does not outwardly appear to be wealthy, even though clearly he is. So Joseph is really hopeful that Needham can use reports from his contact in Spain to help find Stephen Maturin. And he owns up to the fact that Stephen Maturin is one of his most important agents. So we've got Sir Joseph then leaving the meeting, walking home, continuing to think about his good friend Stephen. And in his thinking about this, provides great background on Stephen and Diana to new readers or to those who are catching up. And as he comes to his doorway, he's startled to see Stephen standing there smiling down at him. And, you know, he's, he's not only startled, he's also delighted. He says, you know, you're as welcome as the first Red Admiral in spring. Uh-huh. The Red Admiral is a butterfly. We remember Sir Joseph was sketching in the first chapter of HMS Surprise in the middle of an oh, admiralty yeah. meeting. So it also was a French intelligence agent on the Diana, but we won't get into that. A different Red Admiral. Stephen's surprised by all the fuss that Sir Joseph is making over him. And Sir Joseph says, you look wonderfully well, if I may be so personal, wonderfully well. And I had been seeing you in a Spanish prison, pale, unshaved, thin, ragged, verminous. You know, he sees Stephen's pale face and questioning eye. And Sir Joseph explains that uh, about Dutour's denouncement about the Spanish plan to capture Stephen when he collected his gold. And Blaine thanks him for the cocoa leaves, which Stephen had provided, which has been the only thing that got him through this crisis. And now seeing Stephen perfectly well and and unmoved, you know, Blaine says he almost feels ill-used or indignant. And he says, and I, I, I won't be, you know, so gauche as to ask you whether somebody else had warned you. (laughs) <laughs> Ghost rem- reminding me of the, uh, the reference to petrols back in Desolation Island there for a minute. Right. <laughs> Stephen is still trying to grasp the full extent and implications of all the news that he's getting from Sir Joseph. And he says, by the way, we noticed that Stephen was in full Irish mode at the end of the uh, Commodore. He's still right. in pretty much full Irish mode here. Faith, he says, I had not. My safety, our safety, depended under Providence, St. Matrix, Stephen the Protomartyr, and St. Brendan, solely upon my own ineptitude, my own gross ineptitude. I might even say inefficiency. So he's doing the good Catholic thing here and uh, beating his breast and giving a bit of a mea culpa. He's appealing to the patronage of uh, St. Patrick, the main patron saint of Ireland, Stephen the Protomartyr, the first ever Christian martyr, St. Brendan, the patron saint of of sailors. So he's got his Irish Catholic catechism all straightened out here. They had been at an inn where Diana had said she wanted to be sure that they had everything they needed for the next day in Corona. And Stephen, with a blush, had said he couldn't find his bank's receipt for the gold when it was deposited. And Blaine's really horrified that Stephen's lost this receipt. Not the first time, but Stephen's come unstuck a little bit with his record keeping and his paperwork. He can't, couldn't find it anywhere, and he knew it would be impossible to convince the bank without this receipt. And he was near to cursing the day, but that night, he said, an inner voice said to him, poor worm, think on Latham. And we'll come to who Latham is in a second, but it, as, as a result of this dream inspiration, in the morning, he remembers that he'd left the receipt folded up in a book in Latham's general synopsis of birds before he'd left England. He thought it was a blessing now, since he could take Diana and pick up Bridget and Padine and Clarissa and show them all of his Catalonia whilst stopping to consult with Dr. Yes. This is the famous doctor who deals with childhood autism and other kinds of complaints in Barcelona. So instead of going to Coruña, he picked up the others in Segovia, where they were visiting his cousins, and they had enjoyed a joyous wandering ride through the countryside. And Mike, I wonder, was that really them in that case in Aragon? Maybe it was. Right, he showed right. them all the wildlife of the country and his home, and had caught a special present, as we've learned for Sir, Sir Joseph. And Mike uh, John Latham is a great reference here. Late eighteenth, early nineteenth century ornithologist, surgeon, physician, leading scientific figure, and comparative anatomist. You might even say he, you know, he's the in in many parts the, the carbon copy for somebody like Stephen Maturin. Uh, he had published this synopsis that Stephen's referring to 
1781 to 1787. And thank you to their Patrick O'Brien muster book for the reference there. Well, this special present for Sir Joseph, Stephen hand Sir Joseph a case containing a Draxus jasus, also called the two-tailed pasha, a butterfly rare in most of Europe. And Sir Joseph's delighted when he hears about this. He says, you know, he's never been able to catch one. He's had to settle for low quality purchase specimens. And he's taking this case that Stephen handed him back to his collection. But then he, he's looking at it and he stops his, his kind of happy, eager look drops. And he asks Stephen if Stephen would make game of him on such an important subject. And Stephen says, take it back and compare it with your purchase specimens. Blaine does. And he's kind of looking and comparing these. And then he realizes, he says, it's a melanistic Jaraxxus. And he's absolutely <laughs> delighted. Says he didn't know they existed. He's never read or heard about them. He blesses and thanks Stephen, saying that he's going to write a paper about it for the proceedings. Such a paper. Right? Oh, great stuff. Oh. So the, this this Charaxis jaceus, a, a beautiful butterfly, we learn with different colors, with patterns on the top and on the bottom sides. It's a perfect pick for O'Brien heroes because it's drawn to fermenting fruits and it's attracted to the ethanol in them. And all of our characters, I think, like a glass of wine. You can capture this butterfly by baiting it, by tempting it with an open bottle of or glass of wine or other alcoholic uh, beverages. We'll see if we can get you a picture of Caraxes Jaceus, also known as the two-tailed Pasha, uh, on the internet. M- melanism is an interesting condition as well, Mike, isn't it? It's, it's the reverse of albinism. You're not pale pigmented, you're dark pigmented. So melanism is a very rare overdevelopment of melanin in the skin that can turn some animals or insects partially or completely black. A, a black panther is a melanistic leopard or a melanistic jaguar. So that's the connection here. Nice one. So getting back to Stephen's journey, so Joseph asks where they went exactly and how they escaped from the fighting and from foraging parties and from the notice of military intelligence or even of Blaine's own people. Stephen said that he would need a chart to explain the journey since he says we rarely steered the same course for more than two watches. And he gets a he fishes hard for and gets a little acknowledgement from Joseph Blaine here that he's got the seamanship jargon all or working for him here he says you're very fond of nautical expressions and occasionally you use correct ones okay little sting in the tail there back to the description of the journey stephen says they'd wandered all over they'd opportunistically been drawn to remembrances from stephen's youth from relatives and interesting sites but they were well south of the most dangerous areas they had seen some french hussars being pursued by a band of dragoons and Sir Joseph asks if this site, this bit of military action here, had distressed the ladies. It did not, says Stephen. Blaine realises that it would not distress them, as he remembers that Diana herself had outgalloped the Salisbury Flyer, driving a four-in-hand on the Stockbridge Road, and that Clarissa had been sent to Botany Bay for blowing a man's head off. And Mike, that, that's a nice bit of uh, really deep exposition for us by Sir Joseph there, and a reminder about the strength and the character of Diana and of Clarissa, of course. So wrapping up the story, in Catalonia, Stephen says he'd been protected by a network of intelligence, had seen some beautiful birds, had caught a ship from Valencia to Gibraltar, and then took the packet home. And here they all are, he says. They're staying at the Grapes. And so Stephen invites Sir Joseph to come and dine with them and with Sarah and with Emily. So we've gone from where is Stephen to he's right back where he belongs, Mike, in just a couple of pages here. Yeah, amazingly so. Amazingly so. You know, so Joseph says that, you know, sadly, he's engaged for supper at Black's. And Stephen says, well, you know, that's a great place to catch a hackney coach. I'll walk with you. And so Joseph asks if Stephen has seen Captain Aubrey. Stephen says, well, actually, he ran into him leaving Black's just as Jack was running to catch the coach. So he just had time to tell him quickly that he'd been in Parliament for the Naval Estimates. That is kind of the Admiralty's report about budget and operations to Parliament. Uh, Jack told yeah. Stephen that, you know, he still had the Bologna. He's part of the Brest blockade. He's kept Stephen's place on the Bologna and that he's living in Wilkham, you know, his father's house that Jack had inherited, since it's handier to get to Torbay or to Plymouth from there than from Ashgrove Cottage. He oh, invites yeah. Stephen and his family to come and stay with him since they have these whole wings of the house that are empty. Now, Sir Joseph says to Stephen, you know, won't you come in just for a quick drink before you go home? But Stephen says, nah, 
you know, we better leave before dawn tomorrow. And I want to make sure, you know, to get the kids to bed. Um, but he says he'll be back next week for the Royal Society's meeting and to lease he and Diana's uh, house on Half Moon Street. Says they really can't afford to keep it up, as he says, in the present state of affairs. Oh, you know, his plan is they're going to stay with the Aubreys while Stephen rejoins the Bologna. So glad to hear Stephen is going to see again. But, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and they're going to try to find a little place in the country and sell what he calls that gaunt, cold, ill omen barum, which will then put them in funds again, as he says. And in the meantime, he hopes to borrow a few thousand from Jack Aubrey. <laughs> well, th- th- it's great to have high hopes. And we left the end of the Commodore believing that Jack Aubrey was a substantial gentleman and landed interests and a member and all the rest of it. But not so. So Joseph takes Stephen by the elbow, pulls him to one side, and in a low voice asks Stephen to beg Jack to be quiet in the house. He tells Stephen that on naval estimates, on the, the kind of parliamentary motion to approve the naval budget, he, that is to say, Jack, had addressed the ministry as though they were a parcel of defaulters in a voice calculated to reach the main topmast head in a hurricane. We learn from Blaine that Aubrey's friends wish he would not be in Parliament, but if he wants to be a member, there are potentially great advantages if he would just attend rarely and vote as he is told. And Mike, it sounds like the Aubrey apple has not fallen very far from the general Aubrey tree here when it comes to <laughs> stirring up trouble in Parliament. Oh, right. When he's in town with a jobbing captain aboard his ship, says Blaine, he does his ship and his reputation no good. And Mike, we get this reversal of Diana's imprecation at the end of the last book. Blaine says to Maturin, Stephen, do take him to sea and keep him there. Right. <laughs> Sounds like another case of uh, Jack Aubrey ashore doing himself no good. Well, Mike, I, I think if any of us are worried about the state of our commands and whether the jobbing captains are up to the job, we might all take this chance to just uh, st- step aboard and see how they're doing. We will be having this short break and we'll be right back to you in just a few minutes. If you're enjoying the podcast, please come and join our supporters on Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash lovers hole. Welcome back. Hope, uh, hope your commands are going well. And, uh, you know, we were just talking about Jack and we rejoined Jack, no longer a Commodore since his squadron has been dispersed. You know, Jack and Sophie are sitting at the breakfast table at Wilcom House and they're waiting for the mail. Jack mm. looks at Sophie and all of a sudden his stern face softens as he thinks, and O'Brien writes, how well she is bearing up under all this. She may not have quite Diana's dash, but she has plenty of bottom. Now, oh. yeah, we okay, good, good. Admires his wife, but what is this? All this turns out that this all this that she's bearing up under is a flurry of lawsuits related to Jack's taking of slavers, oh. some of which have sued for damages, yeah, for wrongful seizure. O'Brien kind of fills us in that after the first ten slavers were found to have false papers. Jack had kind of stopped paying close attention to the ship's papers, and he was very eager to liberate slaves. But some ships had true protection, and others were using legal tricks to, uh, you know, to kind of hold Jack to the flame here. Um, yeah. There were, for example, Portuguese ships who were safe south of the line that Jack had taken north of the line, but they argued that they were there because of weather or navigational error. Uh, some slavers that Jack took had hidden their true ownership behind multiple holding companies. So it was kind of like, who, who's, who really you know, has this ship? Are they legal or not? And whatever the ruse that these uh, wealthy ship owners were using, uh, O'Brien points out there was plenty of legal talent there in London to assist them. So you know, much to Jack's chagrin. Yeah, although there's just the reminder of using the services of legal talent in London might makes me flash back to the stock exchange trial and... All of that nasty stuff. Right. Anyhow, as, as they're sitting there waiting, George, that's Jack's son, appears at the window, says good morning, and hands in a copy of the Times newspaper. 
he tells his father that the gamekeeper, Harding, had showed him a worry angle. And that's a, a grey shrike, a bird that we've discussed before, I think, Mike, just in the previous book. And Jack says Harding had shown him one just like that before he went to sea. And he wants to hear about it at dinner, which is, which is pretty full-on active parenting compared to what we've seen Jack do in the past. Well done, Jack. Um, Jack turns to the Gazette, though, to read the naval promotions, and he sees that post-captains are rising into open admiral's spots from junior rear admiral of the blue all the way up to vice admirals, full admirals, and finally admiral of the fleet. The last nine steps in this process are completely based on seniority and neither merit nor royal favour can advance a man in this Nice bit of explanation here from Jack. He and Sophie discuss the people that they know who've been promoted. And Jack says, if he should ever hoist his flag, he'd like to be buried in it. Very abiding commitment to success in the Navy that Jack's got here. Sophie's put out by the reference to a shroud uh, and death and asks what he means by it. If he's ever to hoist his flag, saying that, well, what's with the if? As close to the top of the captain's list as he is, no one can deny him, even though... She also knows that the Navy list contains eight superannuated or kind of semi-retired rear admirals and 32 superannuated post-captains. And Jack tells her that going up and up is certainly what usually happens, but he doesn't like to court ill luck by tempting fate and speaking as if it's a certainty. He says they don't usually superannuate post-captains unless they're very old or very sick or very mad or very difficult to deal with. And that's starting to sound closer to what Jack Aubrey might be seen as. Um, or he says if they've refused service, but he has seen it done. However, he says, even though men at the head of the post captain's list may assert a right to a flag at the next promotion of admirals, that don't mean they have a right to hoist it, let alone to any employment. But what happens if they do not like the cut of your jib is that they make you a rear admiral without distinction of squadron. You have a rear admiral's half pay. You have the nominal rank but you are neither red, white, nor blue, neither fish, flesh, fowl, nor good red herring. And when sailors call you admiral, the decent ones look away. The other ones smile. In the cant phrase, you have been yellowed. There we have it, Mike. That's the setup for the book's title. If the book's title is about Jack, does this mean that <gasps> we should have some great foreboding about Jack's career? This certainly doesn't bode very well, especially everything that Sir Joseph has been reporting about how Jack is seen at the ministry. So uh, quite an anxious moment here for Jack and Sophie in their little domestic situation. Yeah, Sophie says, well, you know, that could never happen to you, Jack. And, and Jack hopes that it doesn't. But then he starts reading off the names of men who it has happened to on the current list of people, people that they know. Now, he says one of them has taken a job as a commissioner, which puts him out of the running, but the others are simply missing. And Sophie says she's never seen a mention of without distinction next to any names. And Jack says, oh, they don't publish it. You know, their lordships just send you a letter. And Jack adds, if the war ends soon, Jack thinks that more and more people are going to be getting that letter. Uh, he says, oh, can you imagine the cutthroat struggle for commands in a Navy reduced to three wearies at a gig? Armageddon would be nothing to it. No, no. Rather than make things even worse and overcrowd the flag officers list, they'll superannuate right, left and center and the devil take the. <sighs> uh, and he's about to say hindmost, I think. When they're interrupted by the sound of Killigan Bondon cursing a horse. Killigan Bondon, those famous equestrian champions, right? <laughs> they're, they're bringing back the mail from the post office. Jack and Sophie are waiting, dreading what has turned into a broadside of writs, each more injuriously phrased and menacing than the last. And all the other legal documents from the actions already in place against Jack for wrongful seizure. So the Aubreys are pretty weighed down by the legal challenges here. Outside the room, Mason, our friend Mason with an N, uh, the hereditary butler, has given up what he regards as the, uh, the ancient privilege due to him of arranging the letters to come in. He, he's surrendered that privilege to Bondon. So Bondon's carrying the silver tray. Mason knows that Broken knows Bondon had defeated all challenges for the championship of the Mediterranean fleet. And it sounds like Mason is a, is a guy to enjoy his quiet, peaceful, homely life, not a, not a violent cove at all. No, 
No. You know, he'll he'll let Bond do this until he heads back to the ship. Yeah. Well, Sophie, you know, picks out one of the letters from their daughters who are away at school. They're at uh, Sophie's sister Francis's girls' school, and and you know, O'Brien tells us that brings a tear of pleasure to our eye. And then the next one that she opens would have brought tears of another kind, O'Brien says, if she wasn't so good at mastering them from all her recent practice. Hmm. Hmm. Jack puts down his first letters and asks what news she's received. Sophie tells him about the good news from the girls and then with a tremble in her voice says that the company she would contacted to buy their Jamaica silver service can only offer them the melting pot price for the set since times are so bad and it costs so much to remove the inscription. So, boy, they are hurting. They're they're up against it, aren't they? Melting down the family silver, goodness me. As they're sitting there opening these letters, then Sophie asks Jack about his news, and it's not good. Lawrence, the barrister, we remember him from back in Reverse of the Medal, says that leave to appeal has been refused. Sophie realizes that that's the end of all their cherished hopes for that particular case and says, well, we shall have to sell Ashgrove. The creditors will not wait. And Jack's thinking to himself that it's the only solution since Wolcombe is entailed, that it must be inherited with the family. He would not have suggested selling Ashgrove himself since legally it is Sophie's and can't be sold or mortgaged by Jack. And it's a nice little sign of the moment how these two are in a partnership together and she's still generously making sure that she, you know, she's doing her part to dig get them collectively out of the problems that he individually has caused. They had planned Ashgrove together and she'd overseen the building while Jack was at sea. It's a really convenient house for a naval office with inside of Portsmouth. It's currently let out to an admiral who's done very well in prize money. And he himself, this admiral, had thrown out some hints about buying it. And like this little letter opening scene here is getting sadder and sadder. It, it is. It is. Well, Jack asked to see the girls' letters, you know, saying that he knows Sophie misses them, but that in a house with lawsuits hanging over it, uh, you know, O'Brien writes, threats they do not really understand, universe crumbling, parents nearly always sad or cross, perpetually mm-hmm. anxious. It's, you know, it's better, he says, that they're away. And Jack knows this because his father's lawsuits had made his mother's short life so unhappy and had oppressed Jack's naturally cheerful boyhood. And Jack thinks that, you know, and and says that, you know, George is really too young to feel it, but, you know, he's glad that he and Sophie don't quarrel. So, you know, this, this is not weighing on Jack. And Sophie adds that, well, George does seem lonely though. And then suggests, you know, I think in in an attempt to lighten the mood that they go through the rest of the mail. She says, perhaps we are both missing heirs. In other words, you know, perhaps there's some inheritance they'll be finding out about from some unknown distant relative. Yeah. Or or it'll be an email from a Nigerian prince saying that. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, um, true or spam, there was no such message in the mailbox for Jack and Sophie here. So there is a last letter from Stephen saying that he and Diana and Clarissa Oaks and Bridget and Padine and their people, people plural, will be there today. He writes that uh, Diana thinks it's a monstrous imposition to arrive with no notice, but he, Stephen, has told Diana that Jack had stressed the empty immensities of the house when they'd met at Black's in London, and Stephen would not wound Jack by taking hired lodgings. Oh, Stephen, how wrong you could be. (laughs) Jack looks at Sophie, who's clearly taking this for the domestic disaster that it really is, and says, well, what's amiss? Aren't you delighted? She says, She's delighted as anyone can be who has nothing ready for a single guest, in her phrase, let alone a regiment, including that Mrs. Oaks. <gasps> Burn. There's nothing to eat in the house, she says, and the big east wing hasn't been turned out since Michaelmas. She says, I'll never be ready in time, and hurries away. So Jack sees this as just a chance for good fellowship and the you know meeting up of all these old family members and connections. For Sophie, who sees it for what it really is, catering for these people in their current situation not going to be easy no no well sophie's not what she'd call ready when diana pulls up driving this coach and four with an as as the text says an improbable number of people but she's right there at the door welcoming them knowing that the east 
wing rooms are now, as the text says, as spotless as the decks of a man of war and cleaned in much the same hearty fashion. So I guess she's gotten Jack, some of Jack's crew to help her out here a little bit. Luckily, a gift of venison has arrived and the reprieve Jamaica service, a gift to Jack for ridding the West Indies of privateers, is the perfect silver to serve it on. So they've, they've kind of pulled it together for a day anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but so it, it's it's nice that the silver service got got a reprieve as you say for at least just a little while she takes the women into the parlor for tea we notice that we we get a detailed account of how she kisses her cousin diana and bridget and then drops a deep curtsy to mrs oaks not a kiss and an embrace for mrs oaks a formal greeting whilst in the meantime jack and stephen and an old groom and a stable boy put the coach and horses this splendid team of bay horses into the stable jack is very impressed we know that he sees himself as a shrewd judge of uh horse flesh and he asks diana where she got this beautiful team she says she's borrowed them from her cousin mr chumley who's laid up with gout jack says he must have an amazing opinion of your powers he means her powers as a, as a driver of a team of horses and jack had once asked to borrow a dog cart and an ordinary animal to pull it for an hour and this guy chumley had refused Jack, said Diana, smiling, a thousand repartees come to mind, each wittier than the last, but I shall not utter a single one. This is a very striking case of magnanimity in a poor, weak woman who rarely thinks of any repartee until it is far too late to produce it. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. <laughs> She's toying with cousin Jack. Oh, dear me. Well, Sophie jumps to Jack's defense. She wants to claim the right of banter with this particular man. This is my man, and you can all take a step back. Uh, she jumps to Jack's defense, saying, Admiral Rodham says Jack has no equal for ship handling in the service. Horse handling, one thing. Ship handling, something else. And Diana, it says, looked down without even a hidden smile. Right. Well done, Diana. Well... Stephen, in the meantime, is watching George. George is just kind of walking around and around, gazing at Bridget. And she smiles at first, and he keeps walking around. And eventually, she turns her head away. And then George comes up to her, offers her the best part of a biscuit, and the chance to see what he calls his prodigious fine dormouse, who will let her touch him. And now Bridget excitedly you know, jumps at the opportunity. And Jack offers to show Stephen, Diana, and as he says, dear Mrs. Oaks, the house. Yeah, especially the library and the justice rooms. And we remember these are the rooms that Jack loves because his father didn't modernize these. These are the way Jack grew up in. And Sophie, realizing all the things that have been stuffed into both of those rooms and that neither one of them has been swept, says, you really cannot see the paneling when the light is quite gone. Besides, she tells Jack, Dinner is almost ready, and you must certainly change that disreputable old rat catcher's coat. End of chapter one. <laughs> oh, with Sophie Aubrey in charge and about to rescue the situation here. Right. Oh, goodness me. Um, for, for all these kind of outward equanimity, I think Jack's on the back foot a bit here. And uh, Stephen, well, we don't know. We'll find out. It's funny, Mike. We finished the Commodore with everything nicely resolved, and we were wondering what O'Brien was going to do to add a complication at the beginning of this book. And we've got that straight away. The, the, the whole Yellow Admiral thing is you know, a threat hanging over Jack Aubrey. Plus, we've got all these law suits. We've got these legal cases. It, it feels like we're back in familiar territory with Jack, you know, a swim in all these writs. He's in financial difficulty. We know that those kind of financial difficulties don't just dematerialize in Patrick O'Brien books. They have significant financial penalties that come with them. And right. Stephen is probably also in financial difficulties, although he knows that he has a fortune. It's tied up someplace in Spain. And at, at least we know that he has a receipt if the Spanish folks will ever let him have it. And maybe somehow Jack's recent successes as a Commodore have been overshadowed with the bad behavior in Parliament and along with the lawsuits and, and the yellowing it, it sounds like there's a lot of problems here facing Jack Aubrey. I'm not sure which one is going to set the story spinning yet, but there's plenty of obstacles facing poor old Jack. Right. And, you know, knowing Patrick O'Brien, we're probably just getting started here. Yeah, you know, true. I'm, I'm kind of wondering, and it, it's smaller, uh, perhaps a little bit, but 
in addition to wondering, you know, what else O'Brien's going to throw at our heroes, this living situation at Woolcombe may be a little bit complicated. You know, there are still these signs of tension between Sophie's that Mrs. Oaks and Jack's dear Mrs. Oaks. You know, Jack's out of money and he and Sophie now find themselves hosting an additional retinue, Stephen and and all his family and friends. Yeah. Stephen, also without money, we know is hoping to borrow a few thousand from Jack, who has none here. Wow. They're all wrestling with how, how can they get to where they want to be? How are they going to do anything other than, you know, once they've melted down the silver that they're busy eating off of, what they're going to do next? There's a clue here, I think, Mike, that the Bellona is still at sea. The blockade of Brest is still happening in the background. Even though it's not going to be fun duty for our heroes, I think I can feel the call of the sea. But is that going to take half a chapter or is that going to take five chapters? We'll have to wait and see. Perhaps it's no fun then for their wives to have the two men take off to see at short notice in this situation. You know, they, they could both do with some support. There's a family situation here that they can both play a part in. Yeah. Mike, I, I guess there's just one thing for it, right? Well, what do you say in next week to a little bit more Patrick O'Brien? With all my heart, Mike. <laughs> town with a jobbing captain aboard the ship as there is now he says uh, uh, says blaine ah, my brain is not working today i'm really sorry <laughs> you